inspired as well as entertained. Um, so, our <laughs> no, no pressure. <laughs> so, our, our first speaker is Martha Mendoza. She's a Pulitzer Prize winner for her work on Secret from Slaves. If you haven't seen that, it's about illegal fishing in Southeast Asia. And she is a national writer for the Associated Press and is based in based? California. In California. So I'll introduce them each one as they come. So Martha, please inspire us. Okay. <laughs> I am already inspired by all of you, so I'm not sure I have any work to do on that. However, I'm gonna talk about something that I've never discussed with colleagues or other journalists and that we don't talk about in our newsroom at all but is very present and is the quiet conversation that a lot of us are having which is we've become, some of us become parents as we are working as journalists and or we have colleagues who get pregnant and become parents as we're working in newsrooms and we're all making quiet adjustments about it all the time. The reason I don't bring it up with my managers is because a few reasons. One, I don't want to be not assigned to something because I'm having a kid um, or because I'm nursing. I also don't want to maybe be given extra space or time compared to a colleague who doesn't have a kid. And so I, I just keep that out of the workplace. Um, I don't, I've, I'm not seeing nods of agreement. Do you? Is it different <laughs> for you guys? Is it, it's almost like, you know, the kids have to stay under wraps. Um, I, and I have a colleague. So, so my kids are now older. 15, 18, 24, and 27. So really, I've only got a teenager in the house. Um, but I had them all when I was working as a journalist. And um, with each one, I took four months of maternity leave before going back to work, except for Eleanor, who's 18, and was born on June 11, 2001. So I took a three-month maternity leave with her because of 9-11. Um, I know that different people have different setups in their family, but I just kind of wanted to open the discussion with us. I would pump at work. It was, at AP we have these rooms that are glass, and so you, I would be in the bathroom. It's, you know, if you can advocate for a workplace to have a nursing room, that's great. Sometimes my husband would bring the baby to me. My first kid I nursed for six months. The medical world changed so that by the third or fourth kid it was like 18 months, and so how did I do it? Because I have to go on the road. I take the babies with me, and I encourage my colleagues to do the same. Um, I know, but when I, a lot of what we're doing when we're on the road, unless it's dangerous, right? Like if I'm going to a, well, by the time, did any of you hear about the shooting in Gilroy, California recently? It was at the Gilroy Garlic Festival, and so I grabbed my son, who's now 24, and I said, come with me, because we were having dinner at my parents' house, and he was there. And I said, come with me to Gilroy. And so we're driving over there, and he's like, you know, this is my third mass shooting, Mom. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but when they're babies, what I would do is um, arrange for a nanny or babysitter at the place. Like, let's say I'm flying somewhere to interview the governor. Most of that trip is going to be flying, hotel room, prepare for the interview and then two hours for the interview. And so I would hire a babysitter to hang with the baby while I'm doing that interview, or bring them with me. So, for example, I was interviewing Sheryl Sandberg, who was a vice president at um, Facebook and wrote Lean In, and I went to interview her, and I just brought my daughter along. And Sheryl Sandberg was like, I can't believe you would bring your kid. And I was like, my kid's kind of interested in this topic. And so, <laughs> why can't she be here? And, um, and she was fine. In, in the end, she like gave her a book and a t-shirt. And you know, my daughter's like, I want to work at Facebook. And, um, <laughs> another time when I had a five-year-old son, I took him with me to interview the governor of Nevada. And it ended up he had toy soldiers. And so I just was like, kid, you're going to sit here. Well, mom does her job, and you can just play on the floor with this for an hour. Um, so, I don't know if there's more logistical pieces to this. I have a huge privilege in this, which is that my husband has become a stay-at-home dad. But that also was a strong decision we made. So we don't, we live on one income, which means um, <coughs> we go camping for every vacation. <laughs> I've had a colleague who was like, we go to Disney World every year, and I was like, that sounds expensive. Um, <laughs> 
So we live on a tight budget, but we have time in our life because because he's a stay-at-home dad. It also has meant that when I'm like, hey, AP wants me to move to Mexico City, we all move to Mexico City. We take the kids out of school, we put them in school there. Same thing for Bangkok. We just pick up the whole family, rent the house out, and go. So I'm not wanting to preach to you how you should become parents or work with colleagues who are becoming parents. I'm just saying there's a lot of ways to navigate it, and we should try to support each other with this. And I'll just end with, I'm working now with a colleague who has a little kid and um, is trying, has been considering getting pregnant. And so we had to navigate who's gonna travel to places where you might get exposed to Zika without telling our managers because this mm -hmm. felt very private to her. And we also manage, um, you know, my kid's got a doctor's appointment, or I wanted. she wanted to volunteer, and her, her daughter started kindergarten, she wanted to volunteer once a week in kindergarten. Being her her partner, I can, I can navigate that with her so that she can do that and be in that classroom every week by me picking up the pieces of that time and her picking it up at another time. So I encourage us all to be cognizant that we are also parents or work with parents as journalists. Thank you, Martha. Our next speaker is Patricia Evangelista. She's an investigative reporter for Rappler in the Philippines. She's an award-winning journalist and is one of the finalists for the Global Shining, one, Shining Light Award. So, Patricia. Hello. Like, hi. Okay. Uh, I'll start with a disclaimer. I've been told that whatever I say, whatever four-letter words come out of my mouth, or corporate policies I may let out is not the responsibility of Rappler.com. <laughs> <laughs> With that being said, my name is Pat Evangelista. I am a reporter for Rappler, which is a small multimedia digital news agency in the Philippines. I'm the multimedia manager. By small, I mean that I manage a small, difficult, recalcitrant staff of one which is myself, and I'm told I'm not doing a very good job. Um, before I tell you a story, I'll explain a little bit about our mostly female cohort in Rappler. There are a few rules that we need to understand as reporters before working there. The first is that whenever we date someone, no matter how hard we try and how far away from the office the first date is, the investigative journalists and the managerial staff will know. And it means that the CV of whoever will be dating, male or female, will be in an encrypted thread channel by the end of the day, open to unsolicited commentary from everyone, including and especially the CEO. It also means that on many occasions, Rappler will look into our private lives, will ask who we're dating, who we're not dating, will be very concerned, for example, if we're not drunk at the Christmas party. They will open wine bottles if we're sad, they'll ask us if we've gotten enough sleep. It doesn't matter though, because they won't give us enough time to sleep. <laughs> My point is largely that Rappler is a family, a matriarchy, with well-meaning, largely interfering undies <laughs> who understand post-traumatic stress and premenstrual syndrome and who will know most of the time when you need a break. Rappler is also of the forefront of the fight for breast freedom in the Philippines. In the last three years, I've been covering the Philippine drug war. Um, I'm the reporter on the field. I keep a low profile, but I investigate everything from vigilantes to police assassinations to the victims of President Rodrigo Duterte's war on drugs. In 2018, we, I got word that there was a group of vigilantes who had been paid to kill by the police. Outsourced murder, so to speak. And... Um, their victims included a 16-year-old boy who had been abducted, tortured, shot. His body was stuffed into a sack and then thrown into the river. <coughs> we were not the first house to investigate this. Another journalist in another newsroom was quietly working on the story. His bosses heard that he was doing this, and they finally understood the point of the story, to prove, uh, prove state-sponsored murder. They hauled him before a panel, and then they told him to stop. 
they said that this was dangerous for the company and it was not something they were willing to back. The journalist quit on principle, but he gave me the story. So I talked to my bosses and they said go. They understood the point and they said go. They said go when I found the witnesses. They said go when I asked for money that we didn't have to fly out of town and interview people who were in hiding. And they said go when I got my first vigilante. They pulled together a security briefing. Um, there were some rules for that too. They told me to check in every 30 minutes. They said to get out before sundown. They said make sure I don't go alone. All very reasonable things. They also said that before the vigilante started talking, before he had the moment to move, before I pressed uh, the recorder button, to make sure that he was unarmed. Also, a reasonable request. So there we were, my photographer and I, in a hotel room in a city I still cannot name, with a vigilante in the bathroom. So he was taking a leak. And I look at my photographer, who is 5'6", skinny, an oil painter on the side, <laughs> who uh, is probably 130 pounds, soaking wet, and he was in skinny jeans and a checkered beret because that's cool for an artist. And then I said, the moment that guy comes out of the door, you have to check for a gun. And we could hear in the bathroom the water running, the toilet flushing, and clanking. So I said, you gotta check. And the door was opening. And my photographer says, of course. Then he looks at me and tilts his head. What happens when I find a gun? <laughs> it was a question that had not occurred to anyone, any of us, including my multi-awarded managers. So we did a check. It was something we didn't want to know. So that's a pro tip, don't check for a gun. <laughs> um, so we did the interview. We'll call him Simon. He said that he's not really a bad guy. He had killed two people, his friends had killed 20 others, and he, they were willing to kill because it was in the interest of the nation. And he said, I'm not really a bad guy. It's just that some people need killing. That story became Murder in Manila, which is a seven-part, six-month investigation on state-sponsored murder in the Philippines. In the last three years, Rappler has been sued multiple times by the government. Our license has been suspended. My boss has been arrested twice and we're facing 11 cases. But in spite of that, my managers have, have allowed me to go out and interview people like Simon and people across the country who are witnesses and families of the victims of a drug war that my country supports. Because they believe, like many of us in this room do, that it is important for people to know what happens when a country says some people need killing. I am part of a long tradition of female journalists in the Philippines. They've survived torture, they've survived dictators, they've survived the threat of such shutdown. And it bec it's because of them that I can call myself a member of what was once the freest press in Asia. And I'm honored to be sitting with women like this today. So I'll end with that and say I'm also very proud that I never said fuck once here. <laughs> Patricia. Yes, uh, our next speaker is Mina Knus Galan. She is with the Finnish Broadcasting Company and she's an investigative reporter for them. Mina will. Uh... This is going to be a very big leap from the Philippines to Finland. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, I mean, Finland is. Uh, the le least corrupt country in the world. It's um, <laughs> one of the most, one of the most, uh, the gender equality, uh, and number two in press freedom. Norway is number one right now, <laughs> but we change. Um, but I still think, I mean, uh, in Mexico, in Philippines, uh, you're working under totally different conditions that than we are, but I still think there are, uh, we have problems in common. Um, and that's why I want to talk about how to cope and how to prepare uh, for shitstorms that we all uh, have. 
we have to go through. I have this um, paper on, in my office. Uh, this is more or less the creative process I always go through with all my processes. It always begins with, this is awesome, I'm really excited, this is going to be great. Then comes the tricky part, and I think it has become trickier during five, seven years. It's, it's trickier because uh, we are being scrutinized much more, uh, word for word. I work for the TV, so all, all, also frame by frame, by an army of lawyers and PR teams and all the audience and also fellow journalists. Uh, and then the key is how you come from I am shit to this is awesome again. <laughs> because this has to, to do with your mental health. Um, the problem is that when this, or, this is awesome is normally, can be very short, uh, because after that comes the shitstorm. Uh, this, of course, this of course is the same for male and, and women uh, journalists. You have to bulletproof your story. But I think it's even more important for women because I, I think we are, we are being scrutinized uh, more, especially uh, when we're doing sort of hard topics like, like financial crime, for example. I don't know if, if you agree, but this is my experience. And I think many, I've been talking to women here in, in the conference and they say the same. Uh, I had, I had a, couple of examples when I did, I published the panel papers with I, ICIJ. Uh, there was this male business uh, journalist writing in, in social media saying that, come on, uh, give me a try, get me those papers and I will dig a couple of days and I will find uh, tougher stories than she did. Uh, or another example, when I did, this is quite a while ago, I did a story on corruption, yes, we have corruption, even if it's um, less than more, many of you. Uh, corruption in the tax administration. And, and then a male a journalist wrote in a column in a newspaper uh, criticizing the story. And it's okay, everybody has the right to criticize our stories. Uh, but he called me an un unexperienced girl reporter. I was nearly 40 at that time, and had been working for 15 years as a journalist. So. But I have good news, uh, they don't call me a girl anymore. <laughs> uh, document everything, uh, and with this I mean document during the research. Your emails, um, I recall the, the, um, the phone calls, I know in some countries you're not allowed to do that, in Germany for example. Um, document and keep them in order because when the shitstorm comes, it's it's very important for you to have them. You can you can if, if somebody is saying that you have have errors or, or or fact errors or or you've been doing ethically something wrong, you can show that that that's not the case. This is maybe the most difficult tip. Don't let them get under your skin when they criticizing, and I think the critics we get as women is more, it's, it's different, it's harder, and it's often more personal uh, and sexist. Uh, I talked to my young colleague uh, at, in our team, and she did a story, and after that story, she noticed online that uh, they were discussing the size of her breasts. Uh, her tip is that if you know that there's something like that over there, let your colleague or your boss read that because you can be quite, I mean, you're stressed after you, you're, you have published, you're vulnerable, maybe you react in the wrong way, so let somebody else go through them and then you react if needed. Uh, and always remember that journalist is a role and they're not criticizing you as a person, they are criticizing you as a journalist, so we should, it's easy to say, and I mean, but maybe that, that could help to remember. Uh, for me, a good boss or editor, uh, for me is a producer, uh, is like a buffer or a bumper, I think, in, in the US. The, the 
bumper that the trains have when they come to the railway station that that absorbs the shock. So so when there's a lot of criticism or you, you have the, the editor helping you. I, I published a, a couple of weeks ago a story uh, and just a couple of days before the story was published, the CEO of the big hospital started writing very aggressive emails to me. And my producer took over that correspondence together with a, with a lawyer of, of our company. And that was very good. She gave me time for finishing my story and I could concentrate on that. And she was the buffer. And I think a good boss is like that. Um, it all also helps to get peer support, so work in pairs or, or work in teams, cross-border or with your own team. I, I always think that that's, that helps because it's not the same thing to talk about these, uh, these problems with your family, for example. They, they don't really understand, but your colleague understands exactly what, what's going on. And my late, last tip is get inspired, help your... Uh, Help your colleagues, they will help you and get inspired um, by all these amazing women investigators in this room. Thank you. So from Finland to Mexico, Marcela Torati is a reporter and founder right, of um, Quinto Elemento and uh, periodistas Apie. So, Marcela, tell us your story. Yes, thank you. Uh, okay, I wanted to share uh, about how in Mexico, uh, a reporter asked me, covering the 12 years, the violence, uh, how we can uh, deal with this as women reporters. So at the beginning, like 12 years ago, in the newsroom when I was when in my magazine where I work, uh, they sent me, for example, to Ciudad Juarez, the most violent city in the world. And I returned and I tried to talk about what I experienced, what I saw, uh, about the, if I feel some kind of fear, or I, I want to cry sometimes no? with colleagues because I I, pres I experience um, I presence pres I be uh, interviewing many uh, massacre survivors for example uh, and in the newsroom uh, always they say like okay if you are afraid or you're not good for this no or they try to change me uh, and to better you cover another thing and I say like. I like to cover this, I'm good, I only want to express it. So, for example, in Ciudad Juarez, in all these uh, different and difficult uh, trips that I have to do to interview a mother looking for their disappeared children or, yes, uh, or people who have, who was forced to be, to this place, so uh, at night, always the journalists go to the bars and always we talk with alcohol. And sometimes you can see that uh, the photographers are crying or just more with uh, temascal or tequila or whatever. No, so that was my way to process all these years. But when the time passed, uh, some women journalists start questioning like why we can uh, talk about it openly, what we can do. So we learn another ways to process what we, was, what we were experiencing. Uh, and for example, I did, uh, I was with another colleagues uh, for two years documenting mass graves. So we, uh, we decide in one moment when we saw that everybody in the team, we were all women, uh, we have nightmares and we were like, sometimes somebody just turn off and never answer and then return like weeks later and this collaborative 
a work that was really difficult, we say, okay, we have to do something and open a way to express also what is happening in our life. What if we are having problems? So we habilitate like a WhatsApp group all the first. It's like an emotional, contentional group. So when somebody was having problems or uh, was in the morgue, like looking for something and want to, or somebody who cried and didn't know why this happened. So always send like a voice, voice message. And the one, the first one that see it in another city, because we work in different cities, like is trying to contact and this keep support peer to peer, no? So this this was really important for us uh, in all our groups. We are implementing like this kind of uh, support. Also, in that project, uh, in the mass rapes uh, documentation documentation that was two years of our li lives, one of our colleagues was pregnant. So, and she was almost having the baby and we we were like really worried because we want to publish it and but we have many things to we want to be to just to improve the project and to do it better but in one moment we say okay we have to set an emotional deadline because this is the one thing that we can do like her last month being pregnant she can't uh, still uh, looking for corpse or uh, watching photographies, like she has to have uh, something different. So we did, and sometimes we we say like, okay, this the project emotionally is this finished here, no? Also, when we I participate in many networks with women journalists, and when we did do some meetings and things, we try that these spaces are kids friendly, no? Sometimes in parks, and uh, sometimes, I don't know, we, we try to, that the kids are, if it's in my home or whatever, like, habilitate a big bed, so that the people do that, like, uh, the kids are sleeping and they, uh, all the kids together, because we have to discuss things. And also, the last years, uh, we, uh, some, group of women that cover violence, uh, we go to Temascal, that is like a traditional indigenous sauna, uh, or chamam, I don't know what is the name, chamam, yes, that we go together, and we start like, yes, in this path, talking about our guilt, crying, also laughing, and uh, I don't know, it's like three hours, all the ritual, uh, to, to 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 release like some of the these heavy uh, uh, the, uh, see some of these things that we carry uh, in our body and like to be more friends and to yes to to share what we what what that we are experiencing and now in some some of our uh, I organize a lot of uh, trainings for new journalists or for journalists who cover human rights and sometimes the last the, the last year I thought maybe if I bring a, like a shaman it could be fine I will I will say to the people that there is a shaman if you want to speak with him or whatever he can clean you like with this herbs and different rituals and I was surprised because the men uh, say yes, and, and we have like a traditional shamanic ritual, like, and we were offering to the four points, uh, uh, to the, uh, we were offering, I don't know, our wishes, and we use the candles and things like that, and at the next day, the, many of us and many, the men, uh, went to private consultation with him, and one of them, he told me like, thank you because now I can, I can sleep, no? Since I saw him, I can sleep and thank you for thinking also in us and invite us to this 
So that was also learned, uh, what I, we learned that we can share this other way to cope with violence uh, with men and to share another way, different than the macho way to deal with violence. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, Marcella. It will receive the Cabot Awards for journalism in Latin America next month. Congratulations. Uh, our, our next speaker is Miranda Patucci. She's an investigative reporter for the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project and won the Global Shining Light Award. When was that? Last year? Um, or the year? Last year and last two year, years ago. Last year, two years ago. She's a two time winner. Miranda. So would you like to hear my Instagram story or my real life story? <laughs> Instagram. Um, so I'll tell you both. Um, it, it, my career path was kind of uh, strange. I was uh, very much a regional reporter and suddenly I became a global reporter and started reporting some of the most difficult parts of the world, including Central Asia and Azerbaijan. And part of the reason why I got into this is because first my friend was jailed, and then I started seeing all these stories that are not being published because the reporters are threatened, and you know I felt like I have the skills to do some of these stories, and I started doing them. But as part of doing these stories, uh, you know, I would come to different places and uh, you know, a young woman would tell me, you're my hero, you're doing something that nobody else could do. And for a while, I felt I had to live up to the role of a hero. <laughs> you know, I have to be the superwoman. I have to help anybody who asks me for help. I have to do so many stories at once. And I felt like I was living my, wor my, my work 24 hours a day. And, you know, in a way that has paid off. These are all the costs that I, you know, within a year I won five or six major awards. Um, I spoke at almost every single event um, that I was invited to. I won a night award uh, for a life achievement. And at that point, um, you know, I thought, well, did I accomplish everything I could in my life? Is this all um, there is for me? So this was my public, um, you know, profile. This is what I was sharing with the world. But deep down during the times that I was recognized the most for the work I have done, I was actually secretly falling apart. And nobody has seen that. I was pushing myself so hard that um, I couldn't focus anymore. I was not productive anymore. I, was, I, I, felt like, I felt like I was failing. At the time, I was the most recognized person. And you know, this was the end of the 2006. I was in Kazakhstan for two weeks, and um, you don't see it from my uh, Facebook post. I said, my last day of minus 30. At the time, I was struggling with pneumonia for two weeks, and I still felt I cannot fail. I have to deliver whatever I was doing there, and I pushed and pushed myself. And finally, I went to Sarajevo to my home, and I was so sick that I ended up lying in bed for two weeks. And of course, I missed everything that was happening because I was, I have killed myself. And what happened after this, and this is something that I have been hiding for so long, I had a burnout. And that meant that my brain exploded. And my brain exploded in a way that I had memory loss. And I couldn't remember names of people, I couldn't remember names of my neighbors. It was that bad. I had panic attacks. I would wake up at 3 a.m. in the middle of the night and I would look at the work emails and I would start responding them from my phone. I couldn't focus. I had this thing where I thought, well, I'm normally very smart. Why am I looking at this document? You know, something that I teach and I'm not able to understand what it says. And I felt like my brain was just a huge fog. Like I, I just I felt confused at times and tired. And I felt, well, I can't do this anymore. And I wasn't telling it to anybody. And then one day, and I would have these, you know, little escapes where I would, you know, um, go on my own and for three days just there to see. 
or be in the mountain and try to like not talk to anybody. And then one day I talked to my colleague and he said, I'm taking six months off because I have a burnout. And I was like, what is a burnout? <laughs> and he started telling me, and from what he was telling me, he had exactly every single thing I had. And for the while, I just felt I'm the failure. You know, I have failed everybody who told me I'm a superwoman. And after that, I spoke with my cousin who is doctor, and she, does, she said, yeah, you have a burnout. And she told me something that I never, she told me just stop, <coughs> slow down, rest, sleep. And I, for a while, I didn't believe her that that was my cure. So I kept pushing myself, pushing myself, and in the end, I realized, oh, I have to do something or I'm going to lose everything I have built, you know, and everything I have worked. And I won't be able to do any of the superpower stories. So here are a few things that I learned from this experience. Uh, fortunately, I was very lucky and I managed to recover from my burnout. And um, it took about a year to recover to what I had done to myself by pushing myself so hard. Um, but it was hard, hard to admit, but I'm just a human. And I cannot do everything. And I cannot say yes to everybody. And I cannot be perfect, at least not all the time. <laughs> I still try to be perfect. <laughs> and I do only have 24 hours in a day. I used to believe that in 24 hours I can do three days of work, not sleep at all, I just push myself. So now I sleep. And, you know, I just try to be honest of who I am and what I can do and admit that sometimes I cannot do everything. Thank you. Thank you, Miranda, for that very honest and inspiring story. Remember, there are only 24 hours in a day, and we should all sleep. Yes, next speaker is Juliana Yoffer from BuzzFeed News. Yes, uh, I'm trying to open this presentation. That works. Uh, you need help me just play this. I think that works. Okay. Hi. Um, so, I did an investigation recently where I talked to dozens of alleged survivors of sexualist violence and um, I cannot talk about this because we're currently fighting this case in court, but there was a time during this investigation where I got very exhausted and it made me think about mental health and, you know, how, how I can, you know, find survival strategies for the work I do. So I put together six points, six learnings um, that I want to talk about now um, in seven minutes. Let's see if this works. So the first thing um, is to acknowledge you need strategies because I feel like, especially in those very intense phases of investigations, um, I only went home to sleep, like I wouldn't do a weekend and there was no moment where I felt like I could pause, but this is actually like the exact right thing to do is to pause for a short moment and just take a moment to think about like what do I need to be able to keep on working. Um, the second thing is, um, and that's more like a general thing I learned during the last years, is um, I, tr I try to spread the um, investigations I do as much as possible and there's two things I do um, for doing that. One is like to get a specific beat and try to become like an expert in one specific field because I felt like all of the sources in this investigation who approached me, approached me because they knew I was working on this specific topic. And the second one um, that helped me during this investigation is um, seeding. So whenever, before I publish an investigation, I make like a list of all organizations, stakeholders, Facebook pages, whoever might be um, interested in the story. And then the first thing I do after I publish the story is I go through that list and spread the story as much as possible, and then I can take a break. Um, there is another thing that's not specifically concerned to the investigation I'm doing, but 
um, made me think about like how I work specifically um, as a woman because I'm not like many others. Like I'm not part in a specific organization or um, that is working on women's rights. But I feel like the minimum I can do is um, care about the work environment I have and um, spread information and facts about the work environment I'm working in as a woman. And I brought this example from this fantastic organization, which is called Pro Quote in Germany. And they actually calculate, like they mix calculate the number of women who work in um, print media industry with the power of the position, the leading position they have. And then they calculate, oh, sorry and then they calculate um, this power quota out of it. And this is a picture of this organization and it also shows how long the way um, is there still, we still need to go. Um, so these are actually the numbers from 2019. Um, and I keep like checking on that to kind of make sure I know which kind of, which are the basics of the work environment I'm working in. Mm -hmm. um, there's one more thing I learned during this investigation and doing another investigation I want to tell you about, which is um, to battle report stereotypes. So I felt like I was telling you like how I felt exhausted and I felt like I, I was feeling guilty about feeling exhausted. Um, and I've, I was like asking myself why I was feeling guilty. So I found that there is still like a notion of what a good investigative reporter is and it's like linked to certain stereotypes like being very strong and not being exhausted and being like this lonely wolf like traveling around the world and coming back with all those great stories. Um, and there was one experience I had I want to tell you about which is an investigation I did last year on a person that is intersex. So it's a person who was born with neither male or female um, biological um, traits. So I was doing a story on that. I had a deadline. The story was meant to be translated into English. We were shooting a documentary along the way. And um, I went through the medical records. We confronted the hospital. And then very shortly before we wanted to publish the story, the person called me and said, you know, I'm not sure if I want to do this. Like, I'm not sure if I want this story to be public. So I went there to the town where the person lived. We sat down for three hours. We talked. Um, I tried to be as transparent as possible. Um, I walked the person through what the story's gonna look like. I showed the images we were gonna use, the quotes. I convinced the person, I persuaded the person to you know, publish the story. So that's what we did. And 20 minutes after we published the story, the person contacted me and said, I wish we would have never made this public. And it was one of the most bitter moments of my career. I felt <coughs> horrible because I felt like I had taken responsibility from a person that should have been with the person. Um, so my learning was, I still try to convince people, um, but I don't persuade them. If they don't want to be, like, talk to me, if they don't want to give me information, if they don't want to be part of the story, I accept that, especially when it comes to vulnerable people. Um, and I feel like that's probably not what's, like, the narrative of what a reporter should work like, but, that's what I decided for myself. Which brings me to mental health, and there's just one thing I wanna say very briefly because I felt like during this conference people have been talking about mental health so much, which is so important. Um, so during this investigation, I stepped out with my colleague. Um, we, one, we, both of us, she's a fantastic colleague, she works on sexualized violence as well, and we were both exhausted. We stepped out, we like walked around the block, we told each other about like, very difficult interviews we had and we felt like how um, curing that was to us, like how relieving. And then we decided, well, we can't, it can't just be upon us, we can't just each other tell even more horrible stories that we'll have to carry around. So we went, we decided we're going to talk to our boss, who is luckily very understanding, and told him like, this is what we need to be good reporters and to report the story, we need an outside person. So, sorry, again. Um, so, we decided that we'll have a psychological supervisor for our team that we consult, that we can consult on a regular basis. Um, and I feel like the strategy to convince your company or your boss to 
you know, provide resources is to make clear that you need certain resources that are not about like your psychological health, but they are part of, you need to be psychologically healthy to be able to, be a good, to do a good job. Um, last point, time off. This is my favorite part. I'm a big fan of vacation. So there's two things I do um, whenever I can take time off. One is um, I, do take, I do take a couple of days every year where I take, I try to like leave my phone aside and I don't read news at all, which is again something I feel guilty about because I feel like that's not what a reporter should do, but I try to do it. And then um, it's, it, feel, it feels really fruitful because of two reasons. One is because it kind of puts things back into perspective and I feel like it also puts my ego as a reporter back into perspective because I feel like nothing's going to stop, like reporting's not going to stop. My sources are not going to disappear just because I'm going to be offline for a couple of days. And um, the second thing I do, um, and this is uh, going to be personal and a little bit embarrassing too, um, I'm going to share this photo <coughs> with you of um, the garden I have, my art garden, because I feel like I can do something with my hands. It has nothing to do with the work. And I was thinking like why this place is so important for me and I think it's not because I actually go there so much. It's a garden I share with my friends. Um, but it is because I need, I know there's a place where I can go when I need to pause. That's all, thank you. Thank you so much. I think we should all have secret gardens. Uh, our, our next speaker is here, Eton, independent journalist and filmmaker. From um, is the microphone. I got there? it. Yes, <laughs> the other microphone. Yes, Shiro, please. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, so I feel like this has been amazing group therapy session. <laughs> oh, I needed to hear all of you saying that because it is every story. Well, what we do is sometimes traumatic, and I think I have a bit of different story because I end up investigating my own experience of rape and the time when it happened in 2015 and I was raped by a very senior high um, profile journalist who were um, offering me a work position and that was a nightmare um, but I ended up going to police and and then police told me girl these things happen almost you know every day and we can't investigate this and that was shocking and then i think my journalistic um character really switched on so i felt like i always had two character to be honest you know b one is i i i am the victim yeah it happened to me but the other side was just journalist of my part but questioning or question what do you mean you can't investigate why don't we go to the hotel we're gonna find CCTV and blah 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 so <coughs> I from the beginning I think I could manage it because I had this questioning head and other thing I did is um, because it was so traumatic and also um, I was so surprised whatever investigator was telling me in the end of the day, I found out only 4% of victims would go and report the rape. And also, because Japan has such a high conviction rate, it's almost like 99.9. .9. So, pros prosecutor have to be so 100% sure that they can convict. Um, so, what I found out um, from the investigator was like, he was almost crying, like, I know, um, we found so many evidence, but sex crime is just so hard to... Prosecutor. So I've been told by prosecutor to not take the case and I started to learn how our legal system is behind it but um, it wasn't easy to go through the investigation so I decided to record everything because whatever investigator was saying or whatever was happening was quite questionable. Um, this is off the record, I, uh, I don't know if I can do that here but I kept Stop. And um, I published a book based on my documents. 
and now it's been published in six different languages. I just published in Swedish, so it's gonna we're gonna have lunch party on Monday. So if you're in Stockholm, please come by. <laughs> um, but yeah, what um, what's really scary was that um, right now still I face threat still, and after I reported everything, nothing really worked out, even though we had evidence. Um, so I decided to go public, and their backlash and all the threats start to happen against me and my friends and my family. And especially, you know, nothing was, uh, because the guy was very close to the Prime Minister Abe, and he wrote two books of him, biography almost, so I got a huge attack from right-wing media and people, and I still do. This week I found out there are a future story about me personally attacking me. And um, it is hard to face it. And I wish we had media in Japan who can stand, stand up with me, because I, feel, I still feel quite isolated. But amazing part was, so, Investigator told me, Shiori, if you do this, you can't work in Japan anymore. And I was like, okay, then I will try to find it elsewhere. So I started to work in London with London-based media. That helped me because when I thought about myself, oh, if I can't continue living in Japan, if I leave somewhere, then I need to work. And I, I don't want to give up my dream. I don't want to give up, you know, being working as a journalist. So in a way to be, yeah, have a work and have been able to speak a different language helped me to do so because I know not everyone um, can just migrate to somewhere because you want to talk about some sensitive topic. Um, and now I work in um, from different location. These days I've been covering the story of um, female genital mutilation in Sierra Leone. And <laughs> I realized I still have trauma, of course I do, and um, I've been sued by um, the person I accused with one million euro, which is a lot, and I'm still in the court, we are st it's still in the court, and I'm also fighting, and every almost couple months I have to go out to Japan. And last three days ago, I in, I'm based in London now, and I had my third um, uh, therapy session. Uh, my friend recommended to me to go and I went and I was talking. And the therapist told me, Shiri, the story you've been covering, it's all about gender based violence. And she said, I think you have bi vicarious trauma. Have you heard? I haven't Googled it yet. <laughs> um, so I don't know what that was, but she told me, you are reliving that experience all right, over. I don't know if that's what happened to you as well, but I realize that's true. But I think through covering these stories, I am trying to find the answer for myself as well. So I'm seeing this as therapy. And she was telling me that was, oh, that's not a good idea. So I don't know what's the best, but I think for me, that, that helped me. And also, you know, talking about my own experience or writing the book, writing the book was hard. I have to um, transcribe everything. I couldn't, so my friend helped me a lot and start writing about the, the things I didn't want to remember. But the um, great part was I could fact check everything. Oh, this was what I didn't really, uh, remember, but I, okay, it's on record. So I did an amazing job, I think, at the court hearing because I could answer everything. <laughs> so that really helped me. Um, so I think sometimes, I, I hope you know, this personal investigation wouldn't happen again to me. But this can happen in our life as a reporter. Maybe the story is quite personal and it's really hard to face. But I think, like you said, we have a tool to do that. We have ability to investigate and that's the power we have. And so I think I'm still living in a vicarious trauma, but I'm so happy to be just sitting here and listen to you all because I feel like this whole session has been the best service session I ever had. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I think we all 
need a collective hug after this. <laughs> uh, our next speaker is Oriana Zill. She's a producer at CBS News. Oriana, yes. Thank you all for your bravery and, um, and your honest uh, telling of things that are very difficult to talk about sometimes. I'm so impressed with all of your stories and your bravery. Um, I am a producer at 60 Minutes, which is, for those of you who don't know, in the US it's uh, considered the top news uh, television show. And uh, I've been very lucky, it was my dream job to get there. And it is uh, actually a terrific place to work as a woman, despite what you might read in the news. Um, we, half of all the producers there are women, and uh, I've been very lucky in terms of the support I've gotten that allowed me to continue doing investigative reporting at a high level, both financially, that I've you know, worked for a place that has the money to do it, which is incredibly hard, but also to have bosses <coughs> both male and female bosses who have shown me the utmost respect over my career. And I know that is not the case for everybody. Um, but one of the things that has allowed me to do is to think a lot about, as a woman, what can I do to contribute to the changing world around us and the way we cover news? And one of the things that I've done is I've made a real effort to feature females interview subjects in almost all of my stories. And that is something that, if you look at the past, was not done always. There, there was a, an imbalance, I think, um, across all media in terms of the interview subjects not being women. And women in positions of power and women who, uh, you know, there's a lot of topics that women would lean towards and cover because we are women. And so I've really tried to think about, I can only do four stories a year at the most. I've really tried to think about selecting the story topics that I'm going to do that will pertain to women and feature women prominently on television and to talk about issues that are really important to women. Um, that said, you know, I wanted to also talk about some of the challenges we face in our, in our reporting. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to show you is my badge of honor from last year. Um, which, let me just see if I can pull it up. Um, this was, so I, my colleague, uh, Michael Ray and I decided to do a story um, that was about the fact that the United States government, uh, starting at the beginning of the Trump administration, all the way until today, has been separating children from the families, from their parents at the border. Um, and they're still doing it now. Uh, it's technical, but they are still doing it now. And um, as a mother myself, uh, and I really appreciated what you said about being a mother and the challenges we face as being a mother, I took my baby with me too. Um, but it, it really, it's a story that I couldn't cover, you know, without being a mother. Uh, without feeling sorry and awful for these people and what was going on to them. And I think everyone in the separation in, who covered, there were so many institutions in the United States who did an incredible job covering this story and really revealing the unbelievable, awful things that were going on that were government sponsored and that the government was not keeping track of the children and the families they were taken from. So in other words, a child would be ripped out of its parents' arms, taken into another place, and <coughs> re-qualified as if that child had come across the border alone. So in other words, the government was not matching the parent to the child for a reunification down the road. They weren't keeping track of it. So one of my goals in doing that became, uh, we need to know how many of these kids there are because there were, at that time, more than 10,000 unaccompanied minors, and all of the kids were getting reclassified, so no one knew how many had been taken from their parents. It was just awful. Um, and really, my whole obsession became getting the numbers. So we were finally able to publish, after really cobbling together a bunch of different numbers from a lot of different Freedom of Information Act requests, and FOIAs, and sources, thank God we had really good 
people inside DHS who were horrified by what their, their, that's the Department of Homeland Security in the United States, but they were horrified, so they were speaking out too. So we did have sources, we had documents, we had, we were able to cobble together and find out that the U.S. government, without keeping track of the kids, had separated more than 5,000 children from their parents, uh, and this was published last year uh, in, I believe, let's see what the date is on here, November, um, and we were able to estimate that it was 5,000 at that point. Uh, of those, at the time we published, I think there were 100 kids that had not been reunified with any family member and were still in some kind of shelter. And it, it continued, and from this moment until today, there's a thousand more kids who have been separated. So it's an ongoing story that we're all covering. But this was definitely my favorite <laughs> thing to ever happen to me in my life, because when you get something like this, and you get called fake news, this was 20 minutes after the, the story aired on television. And when the, the big tip I have from this is, Keep trying, even when it's frustrating, and your government is spreading misinformation because everything in here is not true. Um, but the other thing is that when you get a reaction like this, you know you're looking in the right direction because this was another thing I just wanted to show was the letter the day after the story aired, the head spokesperson for the Department of Homeland Security, instead of cooperating with us or offering to do an interview and be uh, you know, on television explaining themselves, they decided to attack us on the internet with this you know, fully, uh, I mean, you could fact check this and probably half of it is not true. Um, but my bosses stood by us and we stood by our reporting and even when the government is attacking you as women, we should be covering these hard issues that, as women, I think we have a particular talent to cover it well and spend the time we need with the victims and the families. And um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. My next speaker is Asha Mengulu, is an investigative journalist for Citizen TV, Asha. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share my lessons, what I've learned in the 10 years that I've been doing this work. Um, and the biggest one is don't be reckless. So in 2012, I was following a story about criminal gangs in Kenya that were being used by politicians to prepare for ethnic violence before the election. Because and, and my strategy at the time was to speak to these gangsters themselves and to find out what they were planning. Because if Ross Kemp can do it, why can't I? So immediately after the story aired, um, the next day I was holed up in the office until midnight and half of my colleagues didn't know I was around because I was just walking somewhere in the darkness. And at midnight when I got out, the security guard tells me some people were here to, to see you. When I looked at the footage, it was actually some of the gangsters that I interviewed. And there had been an incident before because when they went back downstairs to get out of the building, they were found to have been armed. So that was the first incident. I didn't think much of it. My bosses didn't think much of it because for those of us working in the developing world in the global south, you do know that security is not really a priority for our newsrooms most of the times. The second incident where I thought I was very reckless was in 2014. Al-Shabaab had attacked a bus that was leaving northern Kenya for Nairobi and they had shot dead 28 people. Most of them were teachers and they were non-locals. So I traveled up to investigate what this had done to the education sector in Mandela because most of those killed had been teachers and a lot of the teachers working in that area retreated and left because they didn't feel secure. When I got to Mandera, I ended up unraveling one of my biggest stories in my career, which was that there was corruption at the border of Somalia and Kenya. Police officers were receiving bribes 
from Al-Shabaab insurgents to allow them to cross the border and bring in weapons because they used to receive only $20 per day as hardship allowance. While I was covering that story, I did not have a flak jacket. I was walking the border up and down every day for five days. I did not have a helmet. Um, I only had $40 per day as allowance. That means I had to stay, live, eat, drink on $40 per day. I was staying in one of the one of the most unsafe hotels in town, um, a hotel that was attacked a year later. Um, one of the areas where I was doing my interview during the day had suffered a grenade attack an hour after I left. So that means someone was tracking me and I was perhaps a target. But I did the story, it won me an award. Um, I became the Africa's best journalist um, in 2016 because of that story, but I was reckless. So the thing that was a wake-up call for me was when I was investigating police officers said to be um, killing gangsters in Nairobi's neighborhoods. They, they had Facebook accounts where they would put warnings with photographs of young men that they claimed were gangsters and they would say, we're watching you. And a week later, those people would turn up dead. And their dead bodies would be um, posted on the same Facebook pages. So I went and spoke to the families of these men. I filed my story. And the next day, one of those Facebook pages had my face, a picture, a photograph of me, telling me, Asha Mwilu, we are warning you, keep supporting gangsters with the hashtag, do something. I didn't know that that was a call to some of their supporters. My Twitter, my Instagram, my Facebook was all filled with hate and harassment and threats, threats of rape, people telling me don't come to our neighborhoods. And that was, I think, the biggest wake up call for me about my worth. So I'm finding incredible stories that are earning my newsroom amazing cloud credibility, and high ratings, but I'm underfunded in the field. My security is not taken care of. Nobody's thinking about my well-being. So at that point, I made the decision that when we have this phrase in Kenya where we say it's never that serious, so it's just used very casually, man, it's never that serious. If this guy is cheating on you, it's never that serious. So I just said to myself, it really is never that serious. So one of the things I did is that if you want me to do a story, you have to pay me well, you have to fund me well. So I say no. I just learned to say no. Um, I'm the best reporter to do the story. No, think about my safety. And the other thing is I've learned the power of collaboration. So to spread the risk and to make sure that now in case someone comes to, to threaten me or attack me, that I'm not the only one. I recruited my colleague, who's probably one of the few men in, <laughs> 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 one of the few men in the audience, um, Moura. And so now we are two reporters working on one TV story. You know, he reads one paragraph, I read the other one. We're in the field together. Um, and so he now has to worry about some of the things that I worry about. <laughs> but it's, it's also taught me that, you know, some of our male colleagues could actually be some of our biggest allies. When I feel that I'm not safe, when we're working on a story that is very complex, I have someone that I can turn to. And if I feel that there are areas I can't go because I would, I would suffer threats that he wouldn't, like rape, for example, then I send him in there. <laughs> yeah, um, so I've learned to say no, don't be reckless, build a community around you. So I've taken my security personally. I don't wait for my newsroom to plan my security, my digital, my physical safety. I don't wait for them. I've built a community with civil society, um, with agencies that are helping journalists, because at the end of the day, it's also about your life. The story is important, but you are more important.
Thank you. Thank you. So many prize winners in this panel. And last but certainly not least, Pulitzer Prize winner Zanik von Bertuk won the Pulitzer Prize for Investigation on the Corruption of Walmart in Mexico, co-founder of the Quinto Elemental Lab in Mexico City. Zanik. Thank you. Well, it's really a, um, an honor and totally shaken to my bones by what I've heard today. I must confess that I was a bit, um, when I read the whole um, paragraphs of the invitation to this Mark Rucker session, I was a little bit um, intimidated and then a little bit angry. And I said, why do we have to have a session of women? Or why isn't there a session of men? Uh, and they did her, ask for it. We <laughs> demanded for this se section. Yes, yes, we got it. Yes, I, it's, it's <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's become. It's, it's. I, I, I'm. And so I, I, it really has been a surprise how much we can learn from one, one another and how pertinent it, in fact, is. So um, I must unwalk my steps and, and, and embrace uh, all of this. Um, so what I, I want to tell you about is more like uh, things that I've learned um, in thank you in the last um, years investigating that I think are important uh, to consider. I'm not a mother. And I think uh, also women who are not mothers face other sorts of challenges. Um, balance is a bit more difficult. You don't have to get home to do things. I mean, there's other, it's different types of, uh, of com complications. But you don't, we don't have to go back. You don't have to put a, you know, you don't have to shut off your computer necessarily or, or at a certain time. There's, but also, um, your connection to the world is very different. Mothers see people grow. And as they see people grow, you also are in contact with different generations. You're in contact with other issues, other, other aspects of life. And women who are not, or people who are, don't have children, we have to force that into our lives and we have to uh, invite those other voices and those other generations intentionally into, into our lives and with effort. And um, so I just wanted to say that on the side, but I wanted to tell you the story of two things that I've, I've learned um, that are important for investigative work, or at least in, in, from my perspective. And one is, um, I was invited by, to, to work on an investigative story by a very uh, renowned and magnificent reporter, David Barstow, and he invited me to work on a story about Walmart. He just said very simple things like, this must be top secret, you cannot talk about this to anybody. What I didn't know is that I wouldn't be able to talk about it with anyone for 19 months. And so my home, I was a freelancer at the time, my home became my cave and, you know, I couldn't invite anybody in because everything was full with Walmart stickers and, you know, road maps and sources and maps, source maps and so on. And so and I learned, learned several tough things in that story and in the second story. Um, some have to do more with the, you know, the brain side and more with the heart. And I start with the brain. I, I realized how much, how important thoughtfulness is in the process of investigating. Um, basically, I'm, I'm a bit like a goat. I just want to go out to the field and report. And uh, I realized how important it is in investigating to really put a lot of time into thinking. And that's not something that I naturally do. It, it has been an effort, just like, you know, for like a, my reins, like a, like a horse, to think about every step, uh, think how to, how to pitch the story, when, to, when, is it, when is it the right moment to pitch the story, how to pitch it, how to pitch it to, how to start, what is the best strategy to report on, who to go first, who to go next. And I just realized um, how little time I, as an investigative reporter in my former days, had put into thinking. Um, another thing that I realized um, um, is how little attention I pay, with, uh, I pay to my voice. That inner voice that tells you things. And how suddenly the brain comes to, to speak louder than, than your gut and your instinct. And almost instinct is almost always right <laughs> about things. So I also learned that thoughtfulness has to be combined, or you have to, to 
like it, like as in a, like the people who work in radio they had to low, you know level the, the levels of uh, volume you also have to raise the volume and level it up with thoughtfulness so the, your voice has also have to have um, be present and being important and vibrant um, the other thing I, I learned is the importance of um, playfulness um, I think one one fun thing, and it's something that Amina said, remember that curve she said, I think we have a natural training to it. Every month it's like, oh, why am, why am I so sad? Oh, I'm so terrible, I'm so ugly. Why is this okay? Is it great? <laughs> so we have a natural, tra a natural training, and that helps in reporting. Because we know this will pass. We know there will be a sixth day when you're okay again, and you know. So, and investigations are like that. There are these; they have these waves, and it's important that we acknowledge that sort of natural uh, knowledge that we have and, and apply it to our that investigative process, sufferings and highs and lows. And also, uh, I, I learned a lot about how important it is to praise work and to um, to make to make a feast of the happy times. When you have a finding, when you underst finally understand something, as small as it may be, when you finally got the source to call you back, it's important to just lay your, lay your books down, shut the computer down, and just go to the movies. Just also give us some you know, praises for, for the, those rare moments when we have you know, the, the hurrah moment. And that's also important because the next day we will, we will start working with the high in the highs not in the lows and and, and the investigative process will feel also differently um, and um, the other thing I I, I, uh, uh, I feel is super valuable um, more and more at least in Mexico report we didn't have for many years we haven't had access to documents and records and the computers as many people in, in, in the developed world and richer countries for us, for us doing being able to do things on your computer, like search for her address, is absolutely new. So, we have uh, we're more um, reporters on foot. We have done more of our careers like on the streets, and I find uh, the streets that's where the magic is. And so every time I if I feel that if uh, something that's also important is when you we've been so many days in the office looking at documents, looking at spreadsheets. Um, and when you feel lost, really where, where I find where the energy is, where the focus is, where the, the, is, where the magic is, where you, where you return to your passion and your, uh, is going out to the streets and just do some reporting. Even though you don't have to report, but just do some reporting and I think that's, uh, well, coming back to life every, now, every time the things are low. Thank you so much. I just want to thank all of you, both the women and the men who are here, for listening to us and for this magnificent women who shared their stories. And more power to them.